from Anchorage Independent, Barberville Independent, and Graves County. So we want to pause and just let them introduce themselves to you. So they're quickly going to share their name and role, and we'll just go in order um, of the, um, the districts that you see here on the slide. So we'll kick it off with Anchorage. Good morning, everybody. My name is Andrew Terry. I apologize, my video is uh, not working. And so I'll figure that out some other time. But I'm the principal here at Anchorage Public School. I've been here for about eight years and excited to be here with you all. And then, Andrew, is anyone joining you from Anchorage today? Uh, flying solo. Okay, thank you. All right, Barberville, we'll kick it over to you. Board, I'm the Chief Academic Officer, and I serve in a row of federal and district programs as well as several other roles, but as far as dealing with the HQR and HQL, that's the primary. It's a real pleasure to be here. Thanks. And then Graves County. Hi, I'm Alyssa Binkley. I'm the Secondary Supervisor of Instruction at Graves County, and then I have two other people with me. I'm Trey Chambers, a seventh grade ELA teacher here at our middle school. Jonathan Miller, principal at Grace County Middle School. Glad to be here with you guys today. And again, we just want to thank them all for being here with us, and you're going to be hearing from them throughout our presentation today. And that brings us to the purpose for our session today. We do want to provide you with an overview of the curriculum development process and its associated tools and resources. We want to spend a little time spotlighting some of the research to support the rationale for um, using high quality instructional resources and high quality professional learning to support implementation of a locally developed curriculum, and then spend some time talking with our district representatives um, to focus on lessons that they've learned throughout the pilot and advice that they might offer to other districts wanting to implement this work. And so let's start. Oh, let me go back here and just quickly point out, we uh, we know we love ourselves some acronyms in education. So just want to point out three that you're going to hear us slip in and out of today. So often for the curriculum development process, you'll hear, hear us say the CDP. And then for high quality instructional resources, you'll hear us saying HQIRs. And then for high quality professional learning, we'll often say HQPL. So just wanted to point those out because I know you're going to hear us using them today. So we do want to start with providing you an overview of the curriculum development process. The United We Learn vision for public education in Kentucky focuses on three central themes, vibrant student experiences, encouraging innovation, and collaboration with our communities. And underlying all three is an emphasis on student equity. So while the curriculum development process can support all three themes, we focus primarily on how it facilitates vibrant student experiences in content area learning. A strong local curriculum that's supported by a primary high quality instructor resource, it provides the foundation for the vibrant student experiences while also ensuring that all students have access to grade level learning and aligned assessments. And so the curriculum development process, it does provide a systematic approach to curriculum development at the local level. And as a part of our developing a high quality reading and writing curriculum pilot, the districts provided feedback to us as they use the process and the feedback lead to some pretty significant revisions to the process itself and to the tools and resources. So what you see on the slide is just an overview of the process. And as you can see, it does consist of four phases and the phases are meant to be completed in the order in which they're written because the work of one phase is going to drive and support the next. Now, this process would be undertaken by a curriculum team that's formed at the school or the district level, and it is designed to be replicated with each content area. So just a quick overview of what happens in each phase. So in phase one, this is about preparing for the process. So thinking through things like the budget, forming the curriculum team, and then just other logistics that are necessary to help streamline the work and make the process more manageable. In phase two, the curriculum team that was formed back in phase one, the very first thing that they're going to do is engage in a collaborative analysis of the standards and current research for teaching and learning in the content area of focus, while also matching that to an inventory of local needs. And then as a result of this analysis and shared understanding, the team would then work to articulate an instructional vision of what should be happening in the student experience in that content area um, across all classrooms in the school or the district. 
Then in phase three, the instructional vision will drive the work of phase three as the team selects a primary high quality instructional resource, and then they develop the local curriculum document that's anchored in that HQIR. Now, step one of phase three, this is where the content area consumer guides fit in. So while the CDP itself focuses on general guidance that again can be applied to any content area, the consumer guide identifies characteristics of high quality instructional resources for each content area. And this includes specific markers that you can use to ensure alignment to the full depth of the Kentucky academic standards and equity look for to help schools and districts envision equitable or equitable instruction for that content area. We do currently have the reading and writing um, consumer guide available. It's available on kystandards.org and the math consumer guide is planned to be released later this spring. And then finally, phase four focuses on implementing and monitoring the curriculum to make necessary adjustments over time in support of continuous improvement. And this phase is grounded in that visual that you see there on the right hand side of the slide to really illustrate that phase four is a cycle that repeats over and over each year of implementation as the district or the school strives to get closer and closer to its instructional vision. So we know that that was just a very high level overview, but based on that overview, we do want to stop and let you do some processing here. So we want you to just think about this question. How does the current process for developing a local curriculum and selecting instructional resources that's used in your school or district compare to KDE's curriculum development process? So we're going to start with similarities. So think about a part of this process that is similar to how your school or district has approached curriculum work in the past. So everyone just think what's one similarity that you see. And then once you've identified something similar, would you please post it in the chat? And then again, Fox, I, I, if you don't mind letting us know kind of what we're seeing in the chat. Well do. So one thing that's similar to how you've approached curriculum work in the past. We have phase three, step one called out in particular. Okay. Teams and that collaborative teaming dynamic. Yeah. Now let's think about differences. So what is something different in this process that you see compared to how your school or district has maybe approached curriculum work in the past? And again, once you have that in mind, please post it in the chat. So a difference that you see. Budget with a smiley face. Budget. <laughs> <laughs> systematic approach. Mm. Yeah. And I will say when I was back in district, like thinking from that budget standpoint early on was different for me as well. And then a well thought out process instead of a piecemeal process. Mm, like that a lot. Yeah. So as you can see, um, the curriculum development process, it outlines a systematic approach to curriculum development that can be applied to any content area. So the first question that we would like to pose to our pilot districts is what advantages did you find during the first year of the pilot using this systematic process to develop your local reading and writing curriculum and to adopt a primary high quality instructional resource as its instructional foundation? And we're just going to open this question up starting with Graves. All right, can y'all hear me okay? Yes. Yeah. All right, good deal. So one of the things is us kind of thinking about this question, um, like that just popped in my head, first of all, is just having a partnership uh, with someone. Like you you didn't feel like you were by yourself, I don't think. And so uh, working with ANET through the process of selection and then even this year, having them come for school visits and, and just constantly uh, being in communication with them has been has been nice. So when you have questions or when you hit that bump in the road, uh, Ms. Binkley can reach out to Dr. Field, or we have we have someone to kind of lean on throughout that process. And then as far as the uh, selection process specifically, like just getting 
getting like a plan in order to where we could get our teachers voice and stuff, I think was big uh, as far as just getting teachers to buy in and stuff. I feel like we've repeated that several times is one of the big things that we really enjoyed about it is just going through the process, being able to communicate that process with teachers along the way. Uh, I think, uh, I think did wonders for our district and our uh, situation. Yeah. yeah. Also, I think uh, from the principal viewpoint, like having new teachers and, and even some, unfortunately, that aren't necessarily certified just yet, this was a great time for us to, to get a, uh, a content in place and, and to be able to make sure that there's consistency across um, hallways, across grade levels. Uh, I feel good as a principal talking to parents and saying, you know, it doesn't matter whether you get Mr. Chambers or or one of our other teachers, your, your child is going to be exposed to similar uh, materials. And I think it's important also when you're dealing with the experienced teachers to uh, make sure and give them their um, teacher autonomy and freedom to, to bring their own flair into the classroom. Um, and then um, just, just seeing how we've been able to grow this year with the content, you know, like everybody was kind of like a new teacher at first because it was, it was brand new, uh, but seeing how we've come together and it's, it's added to their collaboration because they, they need to collaborate to be successful implementing this new curriculum. Anything else from Graves County? All right, then I'll open it up. Barberville or Anchorage, please feel free to add in. You know, for Anchorage, I would say that um, it was just a very intentional, and I think that was key for us. You know, we knew every step of the way what the what the process you know what the process was. Um, there was no questioning it. It was laid out in a way that just allowed us um, allowed us to be very specific in what we were trying to gain and what we were looking for. So I think that intentionality was huge for us. Thank you. And then Barberville. Yeah, first, I'd just like to echo what they've been saying so far, that idea of a systematic approach. And we'll talk more about this as we go through some of the other panel questions, but that can be time and time again with math, with science, social studies, with any uh, thing, even, even going down to the specials and talking to uh, the special teachers. Have a very So we all have to work collaboratively all the time. Uh, the other thing, this goes back to what Graves County is saying, the ability to ensure that each and every child doesn't know which teacher they get, if it is a 30-year veteran that is your rock star, superstar, or if it is a first or second year teacher that maybe came in through a different option even, that each child is going to receive at minimum this high quality level of, we all know that the last five, six years, the rigor that we've been putting out there has been declining. Sometimes it's called the COVID, sometimes it's called the teachers, sometimes it's called the ability of the children. This gives them a level playing field where it doesn't matter the background knowledge of the teacher coming in. This resource is provided for them. And of course, working collaboratively with other teachers within the district helps to enable them to have them, let them have their autonomy when they're teaching whatever it may be within the, uh, the high quality resources. Thank you all very much. So as we move on, um, when it does come to curriculum development, it is important to understand how Kentucky law defines standards, curriculum, and instructional resources since it impacts, or impacts much of this work. So in Kentucky, standards address a foundational framework of what is to be learned. So they establish the minimum of what students have to know and be able to do by the end of a grade level. And it is the responsibility of the state to establish the standards. Curriculum addresses how learning experiences are designed at the local level. So the purpose of the curriculum is to focus and connect the work of classroom teachers across the school or a district to the standards, assessment, and the instructional practices necessary for students to reach the grade level expectations. Instructional resources are defined as the print, non-print, or electronic medium designed to assist student learning, and they are also selected at the local level. So the instructional resources support the implementation of a locally developed curriculum that is aligned to the Kentucky academic standards. 
when we think about curriculum and instructional resources and that responsibility at the local level, it is important to note the change that occurred as a result of Senate Bill 1 from 2022. So this shifted the responsibility for developing the curriculum and selecting the instructional resources away from the site-based council to the local superintendent. But the language of the law does say that it needs to be done in consultation with each school site-based council and the local board of education, and that there also has to be a reasonable review and response period for stakeholders throughout the process. So to address feedback from the pilot, to improve the user experience with the document itself, and to align with changes in the law from Senate Bill 1, the curriculum development process has a new format and organization. So it now focuses on specific key actions and products for each step of each phase to ensure that the process really does result in a strong local standards aligned curriculum that's supported by a primary high quality instructional resource. Now on this slide, you can see an example of that new format and organization, and this is from phase one, step one. So for each step of the process, what you will now find is a section of text that addresses the purpose of the step and just gives you a brief description. Key questions for the team and for leaders to consider as they work through the step and where appropriate, we have included specific considerations for that stakeholder inclusion. And you can see an example of that right here in phase one, step one. And then the last part is key tools to support the work with links right there for easy access to them. So during our learning visits with the pilot districts, it became clear that those that spent time in intentionally communicating with stakeholders and including their input throughout the process, they had stronger buy-in and support when moving into implementation this year. So to our pilot participants, what particular approaches and strategies enabled you to navigate this effectively? And what's some advice that you might offer other districts based on what you've learned? And we'll open this question up with Anchorage. So one more time, read that, read that question for me again. Yes. So it's what particular approaches and strategies enabled you to navigate that stakeholder communication and inclusion um, throughout the process? And what advice might you offer other districts when it comes to stakeholder communication and inclusion? Thank you. So, yeah, um, this was something that um, we have high um, participation from our stakeholders, specifically our parents. Um, and so first off, just really building a foundation with uh, a committee that was dedicated um, to investigating and digging into the process. Um, something that we hadn't, we, we've had a committee that was that specifically looked at um, HQIRs um, and looking at textbooks and, and resources, but we never had a parent that was on that committee. So adding that parent to that committee, uh, actually a couple parents to that committee was an advantage. I would say that something that um, we tried to do was find a parent that was, um, that had a background in education um, that saved us a lot of time and not having to explain a lot of things. Um, so I think that helped us. Um, the next thing that we did, I think that was good was once we had our selection down um, to about two or three HQIRs, we opened up um, all the materials to the community to come in and investigate. And um, we had a couple of teachers, Lee Turner and uh, Lauren Phillips, who are some coaches here with us that stayed in the room and parents were able to come in, read through the material. Um, they had a questionnaire that they would they would answer. Um, which provided us some feedback and they also had a comment section where they were able to leave some questions but um, we were able to gain some really good feedback from them we also did the same thing with students we allowed students to investigate and see the the last the top three selections that we had and give some feedback so um, i think all of those things really allowed us for a some transparency with our community we were not trying to hide anything in what we were purchasing we wanted them to be involved in um in the decision making process uh, um, and giving us feedback but it really helped us to make that final decision thank you andrew and then i'll just toss it to either graves or barberville the whole process having groups and individuals to collaborate with is so helpful to our district it is important to understand we are a very small district i'll get into this next time. but what we started with was teacher buying because as administrators all of us realize that if the teacher is not buying into the curriculum, 
there is going to be negative pushback. So the first thing we did was bring our entire district ELA team together. And from there, we had them create, and I have a copy here, of what are their top that they wanted to see before we ever started looking at any of the research. And really, that kind of gave us a rubric to go to the beginning. Then we took it a step further, even before choosing our resource, and created a district-wide vision of what we wanted ELA to look like. And we are continuing that process this year. We're having vertical alignment meetings uh, monthly or bi-monthly, depending after school. And our ELA team is creating a living document what they want to see starting at grade level, kindergarten, what should it look like end of kindergarten, second grade, third grade, all the way up to 12th grade. So we have everyone in the in saying, oh, that is something we're going to have to push the grade because I need them knowing this particular part coming into whatever the next grade is. Uh, so I not stress enough Brian was the teachers really led this whole process choosing the curriculum that they're going to use. And then the ADE, ANET, and then Study Sync have been absolutely wonderful in helping us build that platform that we need to roll this out. We were able to get going on day one. And part of that is because of what Study Sync was able to provide for us. On-site training with their tech guru to be able to sit there and walk through a couple of days and answer really every question that we had from the resource. And now moving forward, we've had two follow-up meetings where individual teachers are meeting with process team to say, you know, we're having problems in this area, or how can we change this to better suit the needs of Harvard? But I cannot enough buy in for them and getting them on board starting with day one has made this process just as the most important. And then Graves County, what would you like to add? So I would just uh, I would just add kind of like our process that we went through specifically. Uh, we were able to kind of as as our curriculum committee narrowed choices down. We got it down to the three or four of like our top choices that met our priorities that we really uh, all agreed on within that curriculum committee between our high school and middle school staff. And then from there. We brought or invited all of our middle school ELA teachers and high school ELA teachers in uh, to an after school meeting. And we had samples from companies, um, textbooks and, and some like uh, disposable workbooks and things of that nature. And so we were able to kind of look at those things, even some online resources. Uh, and, and I think that was the most beneficial thing, like for teachers, just because they felt like it was hands on and they actually got to got to dig in a little bit and look at what they would be teaching. Uh, and, it, and it gave you an idea of something that on paper might have sounded good. Once you kind of looked at it, you might not have liked as much. So that would be the biggest piece of advice is just actually letting teachers look at the materials a little bit, because I know it was beneficial for me and other teachers kind of echoed that same thing. I'd also add to that, um, just timeline is very important, you know, because when you get a big group of teachers together to make sure that we're coming away from those meetings with goals checked off and that we're able to meet uh, timelines and narrow down because sometimes we can get lost in the waters of, of spending forever looking at curriculum. And then also uh, supporting your teacher leaders because you're putting them in maybe a, a new position or a difficult position of um, having to work out maybe two people that are uh, really all about one curriculum. And so just, just giving them the support they need. And the last thing I would say is uh, have your teacher leaders share throughout the process with your site base so that your site base committee is on board uh, when it comes time to, to adopt this curriculum. Hey, I know all about it. I've heard from Mr. Chambers, somebody that's been in the waters, and that's, that's really what's best for, for teachers. So I think just that would be advice to districts moving forward. And would anyone else like to add anything before we move on? Yeah, one other thing I forgot. We were able to, starting with this, and we continued through this year, bringing small groups of students in once every two to three months. We're talking maybe five to seven students at the upper elementary level, next time middle school level, next time high school level, to discuss what has changed in your ELA classes that 
seen previously? Or what is something you did see previously that you no longer see? And being able to know that share it with the teachers has been really vital, or at least the teachers say how vital it is to them to know they're moving forward. Thank you all. Yes, and while those, those, those follow-up conversations sound powerful and that that's such an important thing to include, continuing to check in with different stakeholder groups, how's it going, differences you're seeing, et cetera, that's really helpful. Okay, so when we reflect on the key actions of the curriculum development process, obviously district selection of a primary um, HQIR is certainly among the most important. So we're gonna use this section, why HQIRs, to explore findings from the research to offer a rationale for using a primary HQIR to help address ways curriculum isn't yet serving our students. So the need to make the case, as Josh was talking about, for what necessitates curriculum change, especially with teachers invested in curriculum, they've been using perhaps for a long time and, and often you know, may have even helped create. Um, this consistently came up during the reading writing pilot. So after the next three slides, we're going to, we're going to share out around um, as a whole group around what resonates most with you about why resources matter, what data or information most surprised you. And again, even if you've seen some of this content before, new things may stand out today as you come back to it. Um, so we're going to, with those two focuses and knowing we're going to share out afterward, either making some mental notes if, if that's your processing style or holding thinking on a, on a blank, in a blank document if you're digital or on a piece of scrap paper or sticky note, just jotting something down somewhere or making a mental note. Um, might be helpful. So this slide just has a visual kind of smattering of graphics from the research and, and, and the slides we used um, that inform the CDP and our work from it with the pilot districts. So research came from sources, not limited to, but sources like Scholastic, the Rand Corporation, the Brookings Institution, the New Teacher Project. Um, and it explores ways that, in which student learning is adversely impacted by curriculum unaligned to grade level standards and often lacking significantly sometimes in supports. So slides with a fuller treatment of each source and citations for them or where links are available, links to them can be found at the end of the slide deck. So again, if you wanna see those in more depth, if you wanna come back to those to, to support conversations back in your districts, the, the, full, the full set of slides with all of that information is there. So we're going to look, take a look now at just some of the relevant high points from the research. Um, and again, just make, you know, note what stands out to you as we work through these and what wonderings or connections, um, what, what resonates and what surprises you um, might come up as we briefly talk through. So the first, high quality instructional resources are cited as a top funding priority for teachers. Uh, equally rated with or on par with additional staff. So as much as teachers might clamor for additional boots on the ground support, research shows having better materials in hand is right up there as, as a top funding priority, statistically even. Teachers spend a ton of time searching for instructional resources, and you'll see that more precisely quantified in the slides, but a lot of time goes into hunting around trying to find instructional resources. Most of teachers' instructional resources are found online. So Google, Pinterest, or obviously Teachers Pay Teachers. And what they find there um, is not aligned to grade level standards or coherent or at the appropriate grade level oftentimes. And it go, coming back to that word, when we think about coherence, that word piecemeal, you know, kind of a random grab of things that we're hurrying to put together. Resources found online often don't support differentiation those disciplinary practices or students making relevant connections to themselves, the, their lives, the world around them, to other content, et cetera. And these are the reasons that teacher, teachers often give for going online for additional support and for resources in the first place. District created or curated resources still tend to be unaligned to grade level learning almost half the time. So even if they offer more coherence because of the district putting it together centrally, um, they, they'll tend to go to bed together a little bit better, but they often, you know, about half the time fall short of being standards aligned or on grade level, while teacher created or curated resources are aligned about 25% of the time. And lastly, students succeeding on in-class assignments does not lead 
to readiness for future coursework if assignments aren't at grade level. And again, we've all been in class classrooms where the teacher moves are strong, the student moves and student responses are strong, the community is good and rapport is strong. And, and, and at first glance, things, things look like they're really effective. But if the curriculum and the texts and the tasks, if they aren't standards aligned and, and at grade level, the readiness we would think would naturally follow from those effective classrooms or seemingly effective classrooms, that readiness isn't there when they go to transfer or transfer it to future um, learning situations. So this is kind of a summary slide. And just to, to reiterate the benefits of HQIRs for teachers and students as districts consider scaling this curriculum work across content areas or levels for that matter, um, teachers can spend more time supporting students and their learning needs when they're not having to spend that time doing things like parsing and bundling standards, building lessons from scratch around those standards, um, and searching for instructional resources to, to drive those lessons. A lot more time to look at data in a more nuanced way, identify more precisely their needs of their students, and really be thoughtful and more effective um, in tending to those different learning needs as they arise. So for our whole group shared here, we're gonna pause and, and, and briefly just uh, reflect and respond. So if you will please post in the chat for either of our prompts, you can go either way with this um, or combine them. What resonates most with you about why resources matter from the slides we just looked at or what data or information most surprised you? So we'll take a minute or so for those responses to come in before we call some out. And then we'll also invite any who would like to unmute and elaborate a little bit on what they posted to do so. So we'll go ahead and just for either one of those, what resonated most with you, um, you know, what you might have most connected with or what surprised you most, we'll post those in the chat. And Misty, as those start to come in, if you, you know, we allow some time for that, if you want to call out some of what, what you see. And I'm going to go ahead and put, put the, the key findings back up just so you have that to support your recall and kind of some, spark some new thinking potentially. <clears throat> So teachers spending lots of time like searching for materials, um, many which are not at the rigor that we need them to be, um, knowing that the HQIR will meet your student needs. Um, teachers spending less time searching on their own. And then having the HQIR really allows teachers a great deal of feedback time, um, which was unavailable to them before, um, uh, because as a result of them continually looking for resources to stay ahead of the class that is being yeah. And then how seldom school or district selected materials is aligned to grade level instruction or mm -hmm. grade level standards, I think, is something that stood out as well. Oh, wow. Yep. Yeah, I'm peeking in the chat as well in that if resources are a top priority for teachers, why are they still only aligned 25% of the time is a, is a potent question. Yep. Okay. Um, and obviously that, that time spent, much of that time spent um, searching for resources can be, can be experienced as, as kind of a scramble and it's happening, you know, into the evenings and you finally get something semi-passable in hand and you go to bed worrying about now what am I actually going to do with it and how am I going to make it decent for my kids come tomorrow um, and being able to alleviate that can be significant. Okay, so while adoption of a primary HQR, it is a significant move toward improving learning outcomes. Providing teachers with um, an, an HQIR without also providing them with high quality professional learning focused on how to effectively implement it um, will not have the desired impacts. And that makes sense. A primary HQIR and high quality professional learning go hand in hand then in providing equitable opportunities for students and for teachers. So research shows implementation tends to move through fairly predictable stages, which is kind of a comfort. This representation from the Council of Chief State School Officers puts implementation in a curricular context. And after just noticing the, the time frame of three plus years across the top, let's take a moment to look at it. So first let's focus briefly on year one. And teachers have access to the curriculum in HQIR, that probably sounds about right year one. 
And early excitement and successes are tempered by fear of change, inertia, and early challenges. Probably sounds you know realistic too. So looking ahead, then the questions really become: What is the expertise and professional learning that supports people in moving through these stages as efficiently and effectively as possible? What will help them address the challenges they'll inevitably face? And what can you do as a district or building to provide and incentivize that professional learning? The next few slides have content from Rivet Edge Education, which some of you might be familiar with, but if not, um, you can think of it as it, they seek to do for professional learning consumers what EdReports um, tries to provide consumers of instructional materials or instructional resources. So if we double click on one aspect of implementation, professional learning then, it could lay out something like this and what we see here on the slide. A noticing we might have is year one moves from program installation into initial implementation somewhere before, roughly before the semester break. So from there, it's important to note that while there is something of a continuum when it comes to the types of professional learning defined in this framework that reflect an order of operations, we shouldn't view all four types as one single neat progression. Um, and then launch PL will need to be repeated for educators who are using the HQIR for the first time for whatever reason. So because they're new to the school or to the district or just teaching a different grade level or different course. Um, additionally, systems design and leadership support happen all the time. So they're always running parallel to launch and they're in an ongoing for teachers and requiring regular attention, maintenance and improvement. So with that brief overview of implementation top of mind, let's take up our next panel question. As you have transitioned into early implementation of your local curriculum and primary HQIR this school year, what key leadership actions have been most critical in supporting teachers and leaders and or in addressing those professional learning challenges that emerged? So everybody but Barberville having had a chance to go first, we'll start with Barberville this time. If I talk too long on this, please stop me because it really <laughs> excites me. Uh, I'm not going to lie because we broke it down. And now, a lot of this with their partnership with Ramon and Amy, he helped walk us through every bit of this. It's made a major impact on what we were able to do. We sat down before the beginning of the year and created not only goals, but really leadership functions for starting at the district level and then going down through the school level. And then into the classroom. I'm going to walk us through this again. If I get too detailed, please tell me just to, uh, to wrap it up or move on. But we started out by knowing that we wanted at the district level to ensure that our leaders, our principals, our curriculum supervisors, all the way down to our lead teachers had adequate time to look at the resources, to dig into them, to ensure yes, this is that we want to make before we spend all the money going in that direction. And to ensure that, this is why it goes back to we created a document of what are the top priorities for our ELA team. And then even further, what is a whole uh, district-wide kindergarten through 12th grade plan that allows our students to continually move through that using our HQIR. So we created go by 23, the district leadership team would codify in writing a replicable change management strategy system do this in math, in science, in social studies. We've actually already started implementing that with our selection of math. That's what we are doing this year. I know we're not part of the, the math uh, pilot as well, but we are taking ELA and directly applying it to our math. Then we wanted to make sure using our QIP, our quarterly implementation plan, that schools leader, principals, district-wide leaders, would have an improvement plan and quarterly implementation audit, which is what we're starting to implement for the first time this year, with at least expectation as our end goal when we created the rubric for implementing this research. I want to skip the next one and get down to one that really deals with tying in a lot of what we talked about together. We want to engage family, teachers, classroom leaders, all the way through school leaders, to ensure that we can communicate the opportunities that this local resource has allowed us to move forward with 
And then we set a goal by June of 2023 that at least 75% of our school leaders will indicate the training, the planning, and the actual implementation of the project is considered um, efficient for the teachers and improved student outcomes. And we have a wide array of tools that we're going to use to look at the actual student outcome. When we get down to the school level, we created that using a curriculum aligned approach for how they are going to observe ELA. The observing of ELA is different this year than observing any other class because we wanted to look specifically at the implementation of the high quality local resources. So the goal we set, and the teachers were involved in setting this goal as well, is that by June of 2023, at least 75 to 80 percent of observations will demonstrate a strong evidence of the implementation of the curriculum through our walk. And this has a real game changer, not only using that as part of just the ELA observation walkthroughs, but the creating of our quarterly implementation plan, making sure that those plans are designed around resources that we show. And again, let me just quickly go back to the idea of partnerships with ADE, with ANET, and with our curriculum people have allowed us to do this pretty much seamlessly. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. That a very thoughtful and and indeed pretty comprehensive um, response. Thank you. Uh, Graves or Anchorage, anything you would like to add or elaborate, or just what, what was this like from your perspective? Um, I'll just add that the first year I was not in my current role, so I was not part of the pilot process, but I have joined in um, this year to help with phase four. Something that, that we do is really just listening to the teachers and the students to see what our next steps need to be. Um, we're, we celebrate when when there's celebrations, like some of our teachers kind of felt defeated. I mean, first year in a program, you're always kind of going to see a decline because this program is much more rigorous than what we've done in the past. So, you know, teachers were kind of getting, you know, their hearts sank when kids weren't making 80s on the, the unit test and such. So, so we would go back and look at that screener they did at the beginning of the year and those standards and what they did and then how they are now at Christmas. Um, so we were celebrating those successes. And when they looked at it that way, the teachers, you know, they kind of got a little, oh yeah, we are growing the kids. Um, so just even those little bitty wins, making sure we're celebrating those along the way. And then talking about the struggles. Teachers, what what are you seeing as a struggle with the curriculum um, in our PLCs? That they talk very openly about that. Um, and we, we discovered that some of the things weren't as engaging and based on student surveys and teacher surveys and our walkthroughs. So we would, we would tweak things a little bit and have some talks about about how, how we can make this more engaging for, for our students. So it's not just so redundant, the same thing every day. Um, so I would say just, just having those conversations, listening to your teachers and, and just seeing where the next steps are. Like I can plan all the next steps that I want to, but it may not be where we really need to go. So just making sure to, to have those conversations um, so we can determine really where our needs are. Fantastic, thank you. I would echo uh, both of the other districts. The, the only thing that I would add is our teachers and listening to them, they just, like every other teacher, is begging for time. And so um, we have an early release Friday that we have um, weekly. And so I really tried to pare down my professional learning and focus it on, since the vast majority of our school was involved in this HQIR and teaching it, providing time and an opportunity for grade levels to meet with each other, um, time and opportunity for vertical uh, conversations to happen as well um, as much as possible and then just the the continued training um, throughout the school year as well uh, that we um, are providing um, uh, for the teachers as well which they've requested so that's that just along with everything else that everything everybody else mentioned thank you I, I will add one more thing something that we've been we've been lucky enough to do is 
at our middle school and at our high school, I have an instructional coach, which it's a teacher, but they get an extra planning period. And during that planning period, they're going into the ELA classrooms and really able to get that picture as a whole. Um, Cause I'm, I'm working with all the middle school and high school in all content areas. So it's harder for me to get everywhere as the, as the instructional supervisor. So having them there and being able to see what, what they're seeing and, and they're the resource for those ELA teachers. They're able, because they're in the trenches with them. They're teaching the curriculum with them. Um, so having them um, has been a great support. Yeah, thank you for adding that. And gosh, just just echoing so many elements of effective implementation uh, across your responses. Um, you know, highly intentional planning, celebration, time consideration, use of tools and supports, observation, just so many, so many things that we know really help make implementation have the best possible chance of being successful. Okay. Um, so the CDP is designed to be replicated across content areas, and, and that's come up multiple times. Um, and a goal of the pilot was to support districts so they would be positioned to effectively replicate the process for other content areas in their local context. The CDP recommends establishing a local review cycle, which you can see an example of here. Um, and it may be helpful also to be mindful of, of the state review cycle as well. And since one of the goals of the pilot uh, was for districts to scale the work eventually uh, for reading and writing to other content areas, what might be some of the lessons you learn through this pilot experience that will inform future curriculum work in your district and other content areas, or that you would offer other districts um, starting this process? Um, and again, we've hit on this a little bit, chance to build on it here. Um, and we'll just open up after a moment of think time with whoever would like to share out first. Mm -hmm. So I can start off with that. I kind of mentioned uh, a little bit ago, I think it was on round two, that uh, teachers like myself included really, really appreciated like having samples to look at from the companies. And while it was good, what we had was good and I really appreciated it, but I do think there is a, a possibility like that we could probably get a little bit more like from some of the reps and stuff like that. Um, the big example for us at Graves, we're a one-to-one -one middle school, so all of our students have a Chromebook that they carry with them, and so we, we've really transitioned over the last, I don't know, four or five years, four or, five years or so to, to a much more digital uh, style of learning, and so with that, a lot of the uh, a lot of the uh, samples that we were sent were paper copies. They were textbooks, and so we have the textbooks in class, but we don't necessarily use those as much. So I would have, it would have been more beneficial, I think, for us personally to see the full online version unlocked. We got a preview of that, but it was just a sample, like a small little tidbit. And so just seeing that whole that whole thing, I think, would have been really helpful for us. Also, I think, you know, I'm, I like the smart shopper mentality. Don't just take the uh, read the description on Amazon and think it's the best ever, like going down to the comments and read from, from, from buyers. And so um, I liken that in school districts to uh, calling those school districts and seeking out people that are using uh, the curriculum or the top two or three that you have in hand. And, and um, you know, if you know them even better, because you can really trust their feedback. And, and if you don't know them, like say, hey, listen, I just want your, your honest opinion. What are some of the pros? What are some of the cons? What would you maybe do differently? Uh, and so we selected curriculum and, and we're open to as well for, for new districts coming in. If, if you're interested in something that we're using, like uh, we'll, we'll talk frankly to you about, you know, the good, the bad and the ugly. And so uh, those are two things I think that are important for, for districts moving forward. Thank you. Yeah, and we'll mention in a moment the consumer guides, which support that sort of smart shopper mentality or approach as well. Other thoughts? <clears throat> yeah, I would add to that the, um, the, the idea of the use, use of consumer guide, or if you know people, I think we have a group of, I have two schools that are coming in uh, in two weeks here to, to you know, check out and see the program that we selected um, just to see it live, which I think is very smart on their part um, and talk to teachers as well to get some input. I think the other thing for us, lesson learned is just the, the, the time, the time it's taken 
Um, I think I, I think we um, underestimated the amount of time it was going to take to really dive in and and really focus on our philosophy as far as reading and, and writing is concerned. And, and once we figured that out, then we utilized that um, to really guide our selection. But that took a lot of time to really allow our teachers to have feedback and parents to have feedback and our council and board. Um, and so we have revamped our um, our rotation as far as the um, you know HQIR selection process is concerned to allow for more time in that process. Thank you. So just to kind of piggyback what the other two districts have been saying, I think the number one thing is partnership. We're talking about partnership with our teachers, with our community, with the suppliers of the resources, with KDE, with ANET. Um, I, I don't as much the ed report is used as part of the process to especially narrow down some selection was a wonderful tool. And then Ramon with ANET put me into contact with people not only in our state, nationwide. I talked to, I think, a total of eight districts, four of which were in Kentucky or at least close to Kentucky, and the other ones, California, Colorado, from all around. And is asked. The partnerships, if you don't ask, the first they can say is no. So I asked ours, can you send me an in-person uh, individual to be able to do the training? Can I have multiple day training? Is this something that we continue for a three to five partnership to purchase the material we get long-term partnership because it made it quite a bit cheaper? And then one example of how the material has been successful to us is the fact that we had a teacher who went on maternity leave. So she's been out for a relatively long period of time. But it, all teachers would not do this. But during that time, she still set up the lesson to be used on study center. She wasn't there with them, but she was actually still grading their material and giving them feedback. And that would not be able to be a teacher who was just in her here with us to begin with. So having the ability to allow a long-term lesson two months in it, then either scale back or scale forward depending on what the conversation with the long-term sub was having as well, was a major. And then the professional learning, not only bringing in the people who have sold you the resources, but we individualize. Now, part of this is because we're as small as we are. I actually individualize every single teacher's professional learning for the summer with them to ensure they are getting a need, not the shotgun approach that we've seen for so many years. And a lot of those, shotgun approach, Hagen or any of the others, bring good things, but it doesn't necessarily apply as much to everyone. In the world. So being able to personalize each teacher's learning plan really allowed us to hit the ground running, roll this out in after really not even a year, where we start the process in January. And then by June, late June, early July, they were ready to hit the entire year. Thank you. Thank you. Any other thoughts to add before we transition? Okay. <clears throat> so here you can see a screenshot of the CDP's new, new toolkit. Um, for each phase, the first column of the toolkit contains professional learning supports. Um, there's an introduction video that provides background context and a high level overview of the process. Um, then there's a recorded professional learning video that provides a more in-depth look at each phase to deepen understanding and eventually to support application of the process. The second column um, contains sample artifacts from our pilot districts to help other districts better envision what the work might look like at the local level. Um, we thought about the main products each phase needed to produce to support and drive the overall process and then included examples of them here. Um, the final column contains video clips from the pilot districts sharing their successes and challenges as they engaged in the work and their, their advice for other districts based on the lessons they learned. Um, and then this last column um, will contain some additional resources as they apply to help support the work of a particular phase. Um, and again, we mentioned consumer guides. We have one for reading, writing, one to be released in the spring for mathematics. Um, and as, as they're completed for other content areas, they will go here. Um, 
In the opening section of the toolkit, you'll also see a link to the CDP self-assessment tool. Um, and this was something we created to assist districts in analyzing their current approach um, to curriculum development compared to the main elements within the CDP, and also to begin to sort of locate themselves within the process. Uh, and this toolkit, again, was greatly informed um, from what we heard and got from um, work with our pilot districts. So for our reflection today, um, we're gonna use Jamboard to hold our thinking. Um, and that's a tool we may have varying degrees of familiarity with. So our prompt for, um, for consideration is considering the content shared and the conversations had by our pilot districts about their experiences engaging the CDP, what stood out to you as most interesting or important? So that's what we're gonna think about, just big takeaways, what stood out to you as most interesting and or most important. Um, and then Misty's gonna bring up Jamboard and we'll, again, so uh, basically what you wanna do in that left-hand toolbar, you'll just click on what looks most like a post-it note. You can pick your color um, and, and whatever color is totally fine. Type into the text box there when you've got it the way you want it. And I think there is a limit on word count or, um, or letter count, but when you've got your response pretty much the way you want it, hit save and it'll, it'll generate a post-it note. Usually it sticks it up or left, but then you can move it around wherever you want. And you can kind of watch as they come in to make sure they're not over top of each other or whatever. Um, so again, just big picture from our session today, what stood out to you as most interesting or most important? We'll take a little bit of think time and then as you're ready, we can, we can capture our thinking and post them here. Yeah, Fox and Missy, how did you share the link for the Jamboard? I think Fox, are you going to pop it in the chat? I'm going to pop okay. it in the chat right Thank now. Thank you. Yes. Here it comes. So everybody should be seeing it now. So what stats are you most interesting or most important? If you had trouble opening it, everyone should be able to open it now. Is anyone having trouble accessing it? Okay. And if for any reason you're having issues with the Jamboard, you can also feel free just to post in the chat as well. <laughs> yeah, perfectly fine. And there are, so Misty, I'm not sure if you're seeing it live, um, but there are, I think, we, I think we've got pretty much everybody. Okay. It, look, it, it looks like accounted for as far as posts go. I don't know why it's not showing up on my end as live. Sometimes it takes away to, to refresh. Sometimes it takes a minute to refresh. Okay. Um, so if you just want to spotlight any of those. Yeah, absolutely. Um, 
So appreciation of hearing from other districts um, about how to learn and grow, um, really valuing um, that communication and, and inclusion uh, as far as uh, with, with stakeholders, parents, students, and involving them in the process, uh, making sure the why behind uh, or purpose behind the CDP um, and the HQIR, that importance of, of high quality in, in instructional resources is communicated. Um, everyone having a voice um, and then the equity that having an HQIR um, can bring as far as rigorous instruction to all students. Um, having these experiences shared, shared with other schools who are in the process. The pilot districts made me feel supported in the process, how to extend this to all Kentucky districts, bring up time for teachers to give feedback instead of having to use that time to search for materials or content. Um, and last, I think, um, appreciated the insights from the pilot districts, wondering what sort of deadline the rest of us are facing for, for development and implementation. I think that got... And I will just add out there, you all can be kind of the, the first to hear about this, is that we, um, so we're in the middle of a mini math pilot, we're working with three districts on math, but if you are planning to attend March leadership meetings, um, or if you get like the KY standards newsletter, just watch for an opportunity because we are going to be doing a science pilot next year as well. So just kind of keep your, your eyes open about that because the application will be coming um, later this spring for the science pilot. Yeah, and with with the, with the revised standards, that could be a, a wonderful support. Okay, thank you for that reflection. Um, we're going to do a, a little bit of a of a kind of a faux uh, closing and and, uh, and and wrap up here, and then we'll actually I think have a little time to open things back up um, and just see what questions folks might have for our pilot districts. But uh, before we get there. We, we, we so much appreciate your time today and obviously would like to express um, special gratitude to the representatives from our pilot districts um, who took time out of what I'm sure are, are incredibly busy schedules to be with us. Uh, and please know KDE's investment in this work is full and that Misty and I welcome any further communication that might come our way and however we might support. Two final things as we close. First, you can access the CDP either in our breakout session information sheet where a link is provided, provided or by visiting kystandards.org. Um, and when you go there, you'll click your standards resources. There's a tab for that. And then um, on the tab for the model curriculum framework, and you'll see nested within the CDP and then the reading, writing, consumer guide. Um, Second, just as a reminder that the full suite of slides with research supporting adoption of a primary HQIR is included at the end of this deck. So thank you again for being with us this morning. And, and uh, um, whenever we break, we, we of course wish you the best of luck with curriculum work in your districts. But before we do, um, are there questions you would like to ask of our, of, of our pilot districts or, or of us perhaps, um, and we'll open things up. And also, I'll just quickly say we will post a link to the slide deck back in our information sheet in the grid so that you all have access to that. Thank you, Misty. I was going to ask that. <laughs> so again, if, if you have any questions for our pilot districts or for us, please feel free to stay in here and ask. If not, um, you can kind of transition a little early, take a little break before that next session. But again, thank you so much. Yeah, yeah I wanna, let me say one thing about that really quickly. The next session is at 1040 and you're going to go to breakout room one. And that's going to be John Akers, the state director of school safety. So I think when you leave this room, if you go back into the main session, you'll still need to choose breakout room one to get into that session. And that'll be 1040 to 1110. And then the next rounds will start at, or at, I'm sorry, 1040. Yeah. And then the next rounds will start at 1120. Thank you guys so much.